Next door in Kenya, the finance minister later this week will be struggling to balance two competing problems in the course of the week as he delivers a budget statement for the 2021-2022 fiscal year, which starts in July. The East African economy plans to spend over $28 billion in the 12 months starting in July, even though its effective tax revenue base is barely half of that. So here's some context for you. Unemployment levels in Kenya nearly doubled as a result of the pandemic. Nearly 60% of the banking sector's loan book has been restructured. But as we mentioned, the Treasury is still planning to spend over $28 billion, even though the country had raised less than $12 billion in taxes by the end of April. At the same time, Kenya reported its first recession in two decades in 2020, with contractions of 5.7% in the second quarter, 1.1% in the third quarter. But the accommodation and tourism sector was especially hard hit. Contractions of over 80% and 57% in those quarters compared to a year earlier. Despite the job losses, the business closures, the cuts to VAT, corporate and personal income tax were all withdrawn by Kenyan legislators in late December. So then, what sort of tax and policy support does the restaurant and hotel space in Kenya need to survive for the medium term? That's a question I put to Leonard Mudachi a few hours earlier. Until April, he was the CEO of Big Square, a fast food franchise operating in Kenya. I started our conversation by asking him to give us a sense of the devastating impact this pandemic has had on the restaurant business in Kenya. Uh, think about it from a staffing level. You have designed a restaurant to... to to is staffed, a restaurant is staffed to cater for a certain number of people. And you then uh, overnight have 80% of those people not there to be served. So what do you do with the teams? So it was it was really uh, uh, hard felt. So the, the um, March, April was largely now trying to adapt to see what does this mean? Because no one knew how long the lockdown was going to go for. Um, like the rest of the world, we are adapting to the great unknown and we're taking it day by day. Right. You met, you covered this a little earlier with respect to takeaway operations. They, they really do not cover um, the costs as it were. But I'm curious to, to stretch that a little bit further because as I understand it, the bulk of revenue comes in from sit-in diners. And thankfully, at least in this market, we didn't have an alcohol ban um, per se. But has this experience strengthened the argument or weakened the argument for dark kitchens? Um, I think it's definitely strengthened it in the sense that I would say that you had uh, the market was kind of forced to uh, something that was sitting as a revenue stream at the periphery was then forced onto the market. And as a result, we probably were pushed three to four years ahead of where we were at uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, it would have taken slightly longer for delivery and takeaway to go mainstream. I know retail supermarkets and other retail players have also discovered the same in that when people were left with no option, they then took up the, the um, delivery and takeaway. They had to adopt it in the sense that if you wanted to eat out, you didn't have an option of going to the restaurant. If you were a diehard sitting restaurant person, you then uh, and wanted to enjoy a meal, you then had to take the option of, um, of uh, um, ordering in. And as a result, I think we will see in the market. I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited to, to see what kind of new brands will evolve from this pandemic, not just uh, uh, globally, but also locally, in that you now have to think about um, how do we make dark kitchens work? I think there's a space for them. I think the market has adapted to that. But has, have we sorted out those last mile um, delivery issues? Because looking at it, to use the, the supermarket example that you gave, I remember in the early days of the pandemic, um, some CEOs in the supermarkets then, I remember having this conversation with Dan Gidwell over at Tuskies, and at that point they were trying to set up deliveries pretty much from scratch with virtually nothing. Staff members having to figure out how to get customer orders from point A to, to deliver them to their homes at a specific point in time. And we're still seeing those complaints about deliveries taking way too long uh, to get to points, uh, to get to, to clients on time. Uh, where are the pain points in, 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 in that last mile uh, delivery chain? So um, uh, for us, we had kind of uh, started warming up to that because as you know, um, Nairobi specifically and Kenya in general does have quite a few and, and increasing third-party delivery partners. So those took the, the bulk of, of, of the business to start with. Um, so you know them and you probably use them in the market. 
So those third party deliveries uh, took that up and they have models that are designed to do that. Um, what, of course, most retailers and restaurants were grappling with is that the third party delivery partners don't do so uh, free of charge. And so there's a cost to it. And if you had uh, delivery and takeaway being a smaller portion and then it increased, so did the cost or, or, or the commission due to the third party delivery. What, what sort of commissions are we talking stage. about in this space? They range between, in, in a Kenyan context, they range anywhere between 12 to 18 percent, um, maybe some delivery partners as high as 20 percent. But it's all up to, I guess, scale and negotiation ability of the independent restaurant operators. Um, so, how, does, how does that compare, though, to, to say, the same, the same service being offered in Barcelona or in London? Um, based on the trends that I've been reading about, I, I think you should compare it two ways. One is that, what is other markets doing? And I know other markets, um, you know other markets, um, they are, we are about the same, maybe more mature markets are more expensive. Um, some I hear in London and New York going as high as 25 to 30%. Uh, but you can compare it now with an internal developed uh, model because internal developed models tend to go to about six to 8%, maybe as high as 10. And that's what you're looking at. Uh, and that's why there was a rush to develop different options. And, and the digital service tax, of course, that was introduced in, from the 1st of January, that certainly didn't help matters, did it? No, 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 it doesn't. And um, I think there's a whole barrage. I think we, a conversation needs to be had about uh, the taxes, because let's not forget that it was not only digital service tax. Uh, there was a 1% minimum tax, which also read it, its ugly head in the same space. And uh, it's something that is now uh, being settled or being determined by the courts. But it is a, it is a challenge.